Good morning. It's Barb Stephen here, Wise Women, with many thanks to our speaker, Mark Contreras, President and CEO for Connecticut Public, home of CPTV and WNPR, and to Margaret Mitchell for bringing him to us, and also to Alliance Video for their excellent Zoom delivery today. I shall turn it over to Margaret right now, and Wise Women, don't forget to ask questions afterward, as I know you usually do. Have a great time. Margaret? Okay, good morning, everybody. And again, welcome to all of you, and especially welcome to Mark. We're so happy to have him here, as Barb said, his work currently at Connecticut Public, but he also has a lot of experience he brings to that, working in uh, different roles regarding local media and newspaper for places like Pulitzer and Scripps Company, Hawkins Media. I don't think I can name all the markets. <laughs> You're just very accomplished. And um, he brings all that together in his current leadership role at Connecticut Public. Um, I'm sure we're very happy to have him and we're very happy he's here to share his knowledge and give us his perspective on a lot of things related to Connecticut Public. So with that, I turn it over to Mark and I will see all of you afterwards when we ask some questions. Okay, well, great. Thank you, uh, both Barbara and uh, Margaret. I'm going to uh, share my screen and uh, jump in uh, to the presentation. Um, just by way of uh, background and, and uh, introduction, <clears throat> Connecticut Public is, um, is the state's uh, primary NPR and PBS affiliate in Fairfield County. You can get us at 88.5 on the radio. And um, depending on what cable system you're on, uh, channel 49 uh, over the air uh, in television and broadcast. Um, wanted to thank why the wise women. We've heard so many things about the work that you're doing that uh, it, it's a real honor for us to be, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Um, one second. How, how is, how is that? Okay, no worries. Um, okay, good. Um, just by way of background, we have about 100 employees. Um, we're based in Hartford and have a studio in New Haven. But what I'm gonna talk to you about this morning uh, is an exciting development at Connecticut Public. We're going to expand our base of operations uh, in Fairfield County, which has about a third of the state's population. Uh, and we'll, we'll have a presence at Fairfield University with eight to nine journalists telling stories about uh, Fairfield County, as well as other stories in the state based in Fairfield. Um, that is happening now. It's gonna continue for the next five years. And that's kind of the headline on the story that we wanted to tell you today. So one thing I wanted to start out with was to ground everybody on what's been happening in the local media space. I know that many of you grew up reading a newspaper, as did I, and many of you have kept up and know that the newspaper industry has been other, under extreme uh, duress, largely not because of a lack of interest in what journalists do, but largely because of the economic model, which tied ink and paper to the economic uh, prosperity of the uh, institutions. Uh, so I wanted to give you a sense of what's happened since 04 to the total newsroom employees employed by newspapers. In 04, it was roughly 70,000. Today, that's roughly 30,000. And um, couple that with among the lowest uh, trust in government at the time. And so <clears throat> if you couple a diminution of journalists along with uh, declining public trust in government, essential for a fully thriving democracy is that you have strong journalism 
and you end up having uh, increasing trust in government. So we're at a place where there needs to be some supplement to uh, local journalism in particular. So I wanted to share this with you. The blue um, is how many working journalists there are at uh, public radio stations throughout the country. And as you can see from the blue, <clears throat> luckily there's an upward trend. The yellow is how many journalists there are at public television stations throughout the country. And again, as you can see, there's generally a bias <clears throat> and an upward swing, which given the slide that I showed you last time is helping to uh, address the gap that exists in the traditional print world. Um, if you looked across station by station by station, again, blue here is radio, yellow here is television, and this is just a chart of the number of journalists working at each of these individual stations. So you can see at Connecticut Public, we're um, not too far from uh, WFSU in Tallahassee and New Hampshire Public Radio uh, in terms of the number. That number over the next couple of years is going to grow, and we hope to move leftward <coughs> on this chart. Um, some things just like in newspapers are changing in audio. Uh, I, I won't ask for a raise of hands given that we're on Zoom, but my hunch is that most of you have some kind of device that allows you to listen to audio, whether that's your iPad or a smart speaker of some kind. As you can see, in, um, since 08, uh, the amount of the population that has listened to one of these things in the last month has gone from fewer than 25% of American households to almost 75. And what that means is an expansion of audio in the media uh, landscape. People are uh, leaning on audio to a greater extent than they have in the past. <clears throat> um, you can see some evidence of this. This is how many smart speakers uh, are in the US on a population, adult population of 259 million. Roughly 90 million households um, have this kind of a device in their home. This is probably the most jarring slide um, of this whole presentation. So on top are the number of households, the percentages <clears throat> that receive television via cable or satellite in their homes. In 2015, that was 76%. In 2021, just six short years later, it's down to 56%. In the bottom are those who have cut the cord. In 2015, it was about a quarter of American households that cut the cord. In 2021, it's 44%. And my strong suspicion is gonna be that in the next two or three years, that will exceed 50%. So the way that we uh, consume uh, video the way that we consume television is radically changing. And for those of you with grandkids and kids, uh, my instinct is uh, if they're anything like my own 30 year old son, <clears throat> they have already cut the cord. Um, and this is, this is kind of a stark look at what's happening with video. If you looked at the top 18 to 24 year olds, 77% of them, use streaming services. The black line are cable is cable television. So think about that. Only 9% of 18 to 24 year olds use or get cable. Um, the gray are uh, uh, looking at network television. Again, on the top bar, which is the youngest uh, of the groups polled, you can see streaming has just already been the tidal wave that's taken over all other consumption methodologies. If you look to baby boomers, 55 and over, streaming is catching up quickly, but they still have a strong grasp on cable um, with 38%. But you can see what's happening in America right now in terms of how people are consuming their media. It's rapidly moving to streaming uh, and rapidly diminishing the reach and the power of cable television. So 
given all these trends, how is Connecticut public going to strengthen local journalism in Connecticut and in particular uh, Fairfield County? We did research uh, for um, our members in Fairfield County and our non-members. And we asked them, what kind of content do you like? So on the left are our members, on the right are our non-members. But you can see a commonality of interest. For our non-members, news from your city or township is number one. Um, food and cooking, news and current affairs from Connecticut, et cetera, uh, down the line. Our members have a higher interest in uh, science and arts and culture. But again, you'll see news from your city on that list, uh, investigative reports and documentaries on that list, Connecticut slash Northeast travel programs, et cetera. So we got a sense of what, you know, what both groups, our members and non-members like. Um, this gives you a sense of how they're um, consuming us. So in our television incarnation, roughly 94% of our members and 87% watch get us on TV. Uh, another 80 some percent get us on a computer or laptop. Smartphones are about 80%. Social media is 70 to 60 to 70%. Interestingly, radio is still pretty high with 70% for our members, 61% uh, for non-members and tablets, et cetera. So we're keeping a pretty close eye on our audiences and how they consume and clearly making our content much more available on a computer or a laptop or a smartphone and on social media are critical for our future uh, health and our ability to thrive. So here's another, um, uh, I thought, fascinating chart. Our, we have operated for 60 some years, uh, largely out of Hartford, and have focused largely on Hartford and a little bit of New Haven County, and have really ignored um, Fairfield County. Senator Bill Nickerson, uh, and I just had lunch a couple months ago, who's a long serving Greenwich uh, senator, uh, state senator. <clears throat> and he told me three or four years ago, he said, you know, if a gnat flutters its wings in Hartford, you guys cover the heck out of it. If a bomb goes off in Greenwich, nobody hears about it. And uh, so that has stuck in my mind. And we went to our board uh, about a year and a half ago and said, we really need to establish a presence. There was some sentiment um, among uh, some of our board that the, the folks in Fairfield County just really care about New York City. And I was too dumb to know any different. And so we did research to test that theory. And as it turns out, that common assumption is a bad one, uh, that Fairfield County residents only identify as being part of New York City. When asked, both our members and non-members um, when asked, where do you consider a member of? Number one was the state of Connecticut. Number two was your city or township. Number three was Fairfield County. Number four was New England, the tri-state area. And dead last was the city of New York. So what we have heard from conversations with people in Fairfield County is, yeah, we think it's a nice perk, but I really live in Danbury or I really live in Greenwich, or I really live in New Canaan or Westport. Um, and so we thought this data gave us some additional uh, encouragement to continue um, expanding what we do, our, our local journalism work into Fairfield County. So what are we gonna do in Fairfield County to better serve all the residents? Um, I wanted to share with you a brief video which tells the story much more eloquently than I can do on this uh, Zoom call. So let me get this started. And I think that's, that's going. Fairfield County is a place of unique natural beauty with a long history and rich cultural diversity. <clears throat> from Greenwich to Bridgeport and beyond. This is a nerve center of creativity, culture, commerce, and community. With a concentration of innovation and expertise that helps build our nation 
and reaches throughout the world. We are the gateway to New England while supplying human energy and ideas that fuel an international metropolis. Fairfield County is home to nearly 1 million people, all with important stories that deserve to be told and fascinating voices that deserve to be amplified. But local news has been in decline and coverage of vital local issues is lacking. Together with your support, we can ensure that more is done to fill the gaps in regional journalism. Connecticut Public is establishing a local news bureau and putting reporters on the ground in Fairfield County to cover local businesses, government, educational institutions, and more. Strong local journalism results in a more accountable government, a healthier environment, a more fair and equitable economy, an improved quality of life for you and your neighbors. We're also expanding our radio signal in the Fairfield area, and we're evolving our digital platforms to make our content available anytime, anywhere. As Connecticut's statewide public media organization, Connecticut Public is proud to serve the residents of Fairfield County with original local productions to deliver the best of PBS and NPR journalism and storytelling and to make excellent PBS Kids educational programming available to every family in our state on TV, over the air, online, and on mobile 24-7. When you help Connecticut Public achieve our mission, you are making a real difference. Your neighbors in Fairfield County will become better informed citizens, more aware of the issues and people that energize and impact this region. Both children and families will be better prepared for success in school and more inspired to participate in the cultural lives of their communities. And all residents of Fairfield County will be more connected to the vibrant towns, state, and world that they call home. So we were happy that uh, we were able to produce that in-house. All of that was shot uh, on site at various parts within Fairfield County. Um, I wanted to share just a bit uh, with you about our radio signals and where we cover. Uh, I wanna just start by saying we just completed a distribution arrangement with Fairfield University, which you'll see shortly. And that sort of fixed our I-95 problem. If you start in Greenwich on 88.5 in your car, uh, you'll hear us all the way up past Bridgeport because WVOF from five in the morning till nine at night covers exactly what we're broadcasting. So you can get a seamless experience on I-95 um, at 88.5. This is um, our existing footprint and um, we have had these signals for many, many years, um, covering again, most of the state, but we have some holes. So we're, uh, addressing those holes, uh, by, uh, the deal that we just mentioned about WVOF and Fairfield. And we hope to be, um, announcing in April, uh, an opportunity to expand our signal with WXCI uh, based in Western uh, Connecticut. You can see there's still a couple of other holes we are working on trying to fill up, uh, but um, largely on radio, we cover the whole state. Uh, on television, you'll see us with three different uh, over-the-air signals, CPTV, Spirit, and Kids. Um, and on digital, you'll see us, um, th there's a dedicated PBS 24-7 app that if your kids or grandkids want to watch uh, high quality uh, kids programming on their, on their tablets, uh, that is getting increasing uh, uh, viewership uh, from, from, that, uh, from that offering. Um, no surprise to anybody who's lived <clears throat> during the last 25 years, <clears throat> sorry, since, um, 
since Al Gore invented the internet. But um, what we decided to do about three years ago was to create a digital services bureau that could take all of our content and make sure that our content existed on smart speakers, on OTT devices, uh, which is over the top devices like Roku and Apple TV and Amazon Fire, as well as native television apps, which if you go to, uh, if you have a Vizio TV, uh, you'll be able to download the PBS app, which will contain a reference to uh, Connecticut Public and will be locally, uh, locally based. Um, we also own a um, creative agency for video, radio, print, and digital uh, based in Norwalk. And it is Connecticut Public's for-profit subsidiary. Uh, we have had a presence in Fairfield County, but a, a small one. And we think this move will help supplement um, <clears throat> um, Media Vision's uh, presence in Norwalk. Um, just a quick update on what we've done so far so that you know we're not just talking about this. Uh, last summer, we hired a housing reporter, Camila Vallejo. She's going to focus on housing issues throughout the state, but she's based in Fairfield County. We uh, added Joe Amon as a visual journalist. Um, we are uh, going to be uh, offering Fairfield County radio reports from our uh, partners. Uh, it, and we did that starting in July. We hired in August an education reporter also based in Fairfield County, Catherine Shen. We did a cut line uh, 20 years after 9-11 based uh, in Fairfield County with a long-term, very well-respected journalist, Diane Orson. And uh, this fall, we expanded our freelance support. Um, last October, we hired a woman named Cassandra Bassler, who is now our acting uh, uh, assistant news director. Um, we um, shot uh, in December of 2021, a 12-episode digital and television series with a guy named Chef Plum, who uh, does a show every week with Marisol Castro um, uh, called Season. This is much like a Guy Fieri show for uh, restaurants in Connecticut. In January, um, we are gonna have additional uh, community uh, affairs programming. Um, we will, uh, in March, uh, have a documentary highlighting um, the Stamford schools uh, during COVID, and in May, um, additional remote broadcasts for our local talk shows based in Fairfield County. Um, one thing I should, should mention, the, the other reason that we're expanding <clears throat> has to do with our mission. And clearly stated, our mission is to be an essential source for truth, information, and ideas that connect the citizens of Connecticut to their communities and to the world. Um, by not covering Fairfield County, we're missing an awful lot. If, for example, you Googled income inequality by county in the United States, <laughs> number two would be Fairfield County. So from a mission and journalism storytelling uh, standpoint, we think there's an awful lot of stories that are not being told that we would like to play a role in helping ventilate um, uh, along the way. Uh, this is just a look at the cut line I mentioned. Uh, it was done in Westport at Sherwood Island State Park. Uh, this is a look at um, uh, where we live. We actually did the Stamford mayor's race one week uh, was uh, Caroline Simons. And the next week was Bobby Valentine uh, for almost a full hour apiece. I can tell you they, that was a hot race and we covered it as though it were in our backyard. Uh, this is a, a visual for the restaurant road trip we mentioned. And uh, we wanted to um, just let everybody know that we're meeting pretty aggressively with lots of organizations in Fairfield County. Um, we've met already with more than 30. This is a bit dated. Uh, and we've got on our um, radar screen several more, as well as uh, many individual donors and top, top prospects. Um, you'll start seeing, particularly on 95, 
a number of billboards that will point out that if you're on, uh, on 91, uh, 95, you can get us at 88.5. And that is a brand issue that we need to overcome given the many years of not being here. So you'll see images like this. You'll see billboards for our shows uh, with Lucy's show uh, and uh, Colin McEnroe's show, All Things Considered in the Afternoon is John Henry Smith. We do a show once a week with Kion Wolf called Audacious, and I would strongly recommend to listen to that. It will make you cry. Uh, it'll make you laugh. Um, it, it's really well done. Kion's an exceptional talent. Um, seasoned, as I mentioned, with Chef Plum and Muddy Soul. Disrupted with Professor Kalila Brown-Dean is a uh, uh, really good show that explores uh, issues nationally and locally uh, from an equity lens. And every morning you'll hear Lori Mack's voice with Morning Edition on 88.5. You'll also see us at Metro North uh, with the QR code so that if you want to download our app, it's free and it can get you both to our television offerings, uh, streaming and uh, to our live radio signal. And um, you'll also see us in places like Moffley Media, the Hearst newspapers, uh, and others. Um, lastly, I just wanted to end with one, um, with one, uh, I don't want to say uh, commercial for our friends at Hearst, but Hearst owns many of the newspapers in the southern part of the state, uh, including New Haven. Unlike most newspaper companies in the country, which are publicly owned or private equity owned, Hearst is a private company, and they have kept 150 people um, working in their newsrooms in Connecticut uh, for the last several years. It's one of the few news organizations, which is why we like them so much, um, who have not cut back on the journalism that they, uh, they tell. And uh, so we're fortunate in that respect, and I think you'll see us working and collaborating with them more and more as time goes on. But uh, Margaret, with that, um, I'll um, end, the, end the sharing and happy to uh, uh, field any questions that people uh, have uh, as a result of the presentation. Okay, well, that's wonderful, Mark. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. It was so interesting to find out what you're doing. Uh, we have a number of questions related to the material you presented, and then we have some other questions about you and about what you're doing at, and then general questions about Connecticut Public. So I'll start with the questions related, <clears throat> excuse me, to the information you presented. Um, at the beginning, you, you presented slides on information about the uh, reduction in the number of people working <laughs> in newsrooms. And also then the, the other slide about um, the reduction in trust for government. Uh, and we know it's always difficult to attribute causation to co-occurring events, but do you see those as cause, one causing the other or something that uh, maybe can be reversed or, you know, what, what can we do? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. And I'm certainly not um, saying that it's a one-to-one -one correlation, but both issues are concerns for our democracy, the diminution of, uh, newspapers, journalists, as well as trust in government. Um, there are a couple of national uh, efforts being made to supplement local news. For example, we have three what's called Report for America reporters. Think, Report for America, think of Teach for America, except for local journalism. So the way that that model works is um, we apply to Report for America and they either give us or don't give us a slot based on our presentation. They pay for half the journalist's salary the first year, a little bit less the second year, and a little bit less the third year. And it's, it's our responsibility to fundraise locally to keep that position going. So, you know, we wouldn't have three positions that we have today without Report for America. And you know, we're very encouraged by the impact that they can have. Um, just so everybody knows, I spent 35 years 
much of it in the newspaper business. And so the diminution is something that makes me cry um, every time I see it. I ran the newspaper business for the Pulitzer family. Uh, I ran the newspaper business for the Scripps family and Calkins Media owned newspapers and television. And we sold that in 2017. And in all three of those cases, the business model of putting ink on paper became much more challenging despite all the efforts to grow digital. So um, you should know that I'm coming at this as a, um, a rooting for local journalism. And I still root for newspapers. Um, but I realized that <clears throat> the effect on uh, towns and on American society um, is something that needs to be supplemented. And I think public media really is playing and can play um, a distinct role in that. Margaret, does that? Does that yes, it does. And, and we're so happy public media is doing that. We, we are all concerned about having a, an educated and informed citizenry just for our own lives and, and obviously for uh, decisions related to elections and all those other things that affect the rest of our lives. So it's great to see public media you know, coming in to handle that. Um, related to that, we're, uh, we have a comment about the greater use of streaming services, uh, in particular for getting news, that um, one of the most popular shows you have for at least many of our members is uh, PBS NewsHour. Yes. Which many people watch daily. Um, I actually record it, so I um, wanted you to know that. Um, but even if people watch the, you know, the major networks, that you know, it's a half hour. Um, as opposed to a lot of the streaming services where a program might come up that's, I don't know, three minutes or five minutes or is just a, a feed of, you know, basically a headline with, without any other supplementary information. So um, we're concerned about that very much. What do you think of the implications of people, instead of getting a thorough, you know, having Judy Woodruff giving us, you know, a, a lot of detail talking about what, what something developed and implications and so on, then we just get, you know, again, the equivalent of, of a headline or of what might be the last paragraph in, in a newsprint story. It, it's a really good question. Um, one thing I should mention about the News Hour and about Judy Woodruff, for 18 years, there's been national research asking a uh, question, what's the most respected show in news on television? And for the last 18 years, the News Hour, the PBS News Hour, has been number one. And it's just been as consistent as clockwork. Um, related to the question on streaming, um, Streaming is just a distribution channel. So um, there are um, a handful of devices, and I think many of you have heard them referred to as OTT devices, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, Roku. And, and by the way, just as a little fun fact that you can share at a cocktail party, the word OTT stands for over the top. So in the past, you had a cable box that sat mm -hmm. on top of your TV. Right. These are meant to go over the top of that box, around to the back of the TV, and use Wi-Fi streams to power what, what comes into your home. So, for example, if you were to download the PBS app, you could be in an environment, whether you had one of those three streaming devices, where you could consume public media content. And if you're a member of Connecticut Public, you can access, uh, for $60 a year or more, you get to have access to Passport, which allows you access to uh, thousands, literally thousands of uh, PBS shows, movies, content, and yes, the news hour, um, to get whenever you want it. And so um, I'm, I just kind of view streaming as inevitable. Um, it, it's a more efficient way to get um, uh, signals out. But, you know, what it does is highly disrupt what has been a very orderly mechanism to get video signals to people's homes. And that was from a network down to a local affiliate and then into right. their home. Streaming blows all that up. 
but it doesn't mean that the interest in the content isn't there. And it also doesn't mean that in, at least in our case, you can't still get the content. And in many ways it's, it's um, delivered uh, so that you can select which you want when you want, which is a consumer benefit, I think. Right. Well, that's good to know. Um, we have another question about that slide you showed about the differences over the different age groups of the proportion of uh, sources for, um, you know, TV versus cable and so on. Uh, are those differences related to anything other than age or, you know, it? I don't know, uh, any other demographic? Or no, no. Strictly age, age is what's driving it. Age is what's driving it. And <clears throat> I think if it, everybody on this call did a, uh, an unofficial straw poll of their larger family, my guess is they would see, uh, they would see the same kind of trends happening at home. I still have cable. I'm... 60 years old. I will probably always have cable, but my son's 30 and lives in Brooklyn and he hasn't had it for four or five years and will probably never have it. Uh, so um, I just think, again, it's one of those inevitable trends that if you're fearful of it, um, you'll miss <laughs> massive audiences. And we're very focused on making sure we're looking at what 18 to 24 year olds are doing Right. what 35 to 45-year-olds are doing, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Well, um, related to that difference, again, of, of you know, people getting streaming services as opposed to cable, anecdotally, when we talk to a, a lot of younger people or even go to different programs out there, you know, how to cut the cord and so on, uh, one of the justifications people give for going away from cable is the increasing cost. Yeah. It's simply less expensive. To, to go in through one of the other services. And, um, you know, it, is there any incentive or do you, it, is, I can't believe the cable company, personally, cable companies aren't keeping up with this, but is there any likelihood that cable companies will either, I don't know, try to reduce costs or um, combine services or do something to try to retain some of their, their audience? Or are they just sitting back and sort of letting it happen or, or going on and getting, and getting their own <clears throat> Well, I think the cable business is a, uh, is a story of the haves and the have-nots. Um, the big ones, and I'm thinking specifically of Comcast and Xfinity right now, have done some very interesting innovations to allow people to keep their DVR, but then to stream anything they have on their DVR on their tablet. Um, they are also recognizing this trend and they're offering Wi-Fi only with extra high speeds. And so <clears throat> what, what you're seeing happen is very similar to the newspaper business. The means of distribution, and in newspapers that means putting ink on paper and throwing it on your lawn, uh, are, were very similar to the distribution methods in cable, meaning the cable company would access content from ESPN, from NBC, from uh, MSNBC, from, from other cable channels. And they would then deliver it to the customer as a bundle. And it worked for, gosh, 30 years. It worked great, uh, both from a consumer standpoint and from uh, the business of being in the cable business. Uh, but what I think they see too is that two fifty a month that you pay is not going to last, yeah. and uh, which is why you'll see Xfinity advertising now thirty bucks a month for internet only. And they're but what they're what they're in the middle of is um, a transition from what used to be a very lucrative business to one where they have to where they have to offer other things to consumers that are probably not going to be as lucrative for them. Okay, thank you. Well, we're going to switch gears a bit right now because people have some questions about you, Mark. They're very interested in what you had to say, but um, where people are wondering how long you've been at Connecticut Public and, and what attracted you to, to going there. Sure. You've come from some different positions before that. 
Sure. Um, I mentioned briefly Calkins Media, which is based in Bucks County, owned television and, and newspapers. And we sold that company. It's a family of three sisters that decided in 2017 to sell. And so I helped, uh, I helped lead that process for them, and we successfully sold it right in 2017. And I had all this Catholic guilt inside me thinking, okay, what's next? And uh, I saw, uh, I ended up becoming the Dean of the School of Communications at Quinnipiac. And I'd never really been to Connecticut before, nor had I ever been a Dean of a school. Um, it turns out uh, Quinnipiac is a great place with great faculty, great students. Um, <laughs> but uh, academia is a different uh, kettle of fish than what I had been used to over the last 35 years. So this came along. I had always been uh, a fan of local media. When we lived in, when I worked in Cincinnati, I was on the board of the local NPR station. Uh, I have known the heads of NPR, both of Jarl Mohn and, and the current one, John Lansing, from being in the media business a long time. <clears throat> so I was always a fan, and this opportunity struck me as uniquely exciting because we had uh, radio and we had television and a massive opportunity for digital. And so we think today we reach about a million people a week. We think probably within the next five years, we can triple our audience, but that's not going to be by beaming more electrons over towers. It's gonna to be through digital. So that helps explain what got me interested in this. And uh, to be candid, I don't know that I've had more fun in the last 35 years than, <laughs> than helping uh, work with some incredibly talented mission-driven people uh, at Connecticut Public. So hope that's helpful. Well, yes, it does. And, and, and I'm sure they're happy to have you and as we are as well. Uh, but related to, to that transition that you made, uh, what was the biggest surprise when, when you took that over? Did it go ahead the way you expected or were things coming up that you hadn't anticipated? What, what was that like for you? Well, um, it, it's interesting. You mean a Connecticut public, right? Yes, yes. Um, well, just like in any business, um, you've got a group of people who have been with an organization for an awfully long time. Interestingly, when I first got here, I asked our CFO, what's the turnover rate in a given year? And she looked at me like I had four heads and said, what do you mean turnover rate? We don't have turnover. So I, you know, stuck that in my hat and remembered it, <clears throat> but we did a pretty big reorganization based on some earlier research that uh, put all of our content creation under one roof. It's a guy named Tim Rasmussen who oversees that before we had been in radio and television and neither of them spoke and uh, created a digital services bureau to be able to provide digital um, to take our products and get them distributed out into digital. That required that we bring in people from the outside. And so <clears throat> I think that's gone fairly well, but you know, every so often you'll see um, something pop up that um, you know, is the result of the old and the new um, coming together 90% of the time really well, 10% of the time not so well. So that's probably the, the biggest um, surprise. I guess the second biggest surprise, uh, Margaret, is the quality of the people here. I spent an hour speaking to every employee for the first three months. Um, you wouldn't believe the backgrounds of some of the people who work here. I mean, it's staggeringly impressive. And so, um, you know, that I, I view that as a really good advantage for us, a strategic advantage moving forward, because um, when you've got really strong brains, you can accomplish a lot. Well, that's good to know. That was great. Um, and another question people have is about your relationship or interaction with people heading similar organizations in other states. I don't know if there's a formal organization that you typically meet with or informally, but I'm sure you have contact with people 
who are running um, the equivalent of Connecticut Public, but in, in other locations. We, um, we, we do. Um, there's a veritable alphabet soup of organizations. Okay, good. Uh, we, I tend to spend a lot of time, there's a group called the Metro, Metro, it's a group of the top 50 uh, television PBS stations in the country. We meet pretty regularly. So uh, Neil Shapiro from WNET uh, and John Abbott from WGBH are part of that. They, John runs Boston, Neil runs New York. Uh, but really uh, the folks from Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles are all part of that group. And we're able to get really good ideas from them. And on the radio side, <laughs> The alphabet soup is endless. And so a lot of our people, whether it's in digital or technology or uh, in content creation, participate in those groups as well, uh, as do I. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're pretty well knitted into the fabric of uh, public media. The problem for the last two or three years is that we haven't been able to meet in person. Oh, and you know, I know that that has an effect on us, and the culture that we have, it's got to, but it also has an effect on the culture of the system. And um, uh, we're, we're really fortunate to have a guy named John Lansing running NPR. He's a former local television executive. Uh, he and I were uh, colleagues when I was at Scripps and he was at Scripps. Uh, and a woman named Paula Kerger, who is the CEO of uh, PBS, She's probably the most talented media executive I've ever met. So, um, you know, it's a great system to be in. And we don't, you know, we're, we're not um, a publicly traded entity. So we don't have to report quarterly to our shareholders. We, uh, we are nonprofits. And um, that makes a big difference. In, in decisions that we make and the, and the length of time that we can make those decisions for. So for example, our expansion into Fairfield County is a five-year look and we're investing up front knowing that over time we'll get uh, that investment back. Okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, but as you do that, as you talk with all these people in, in other locations, uh, what sort of similarities and differences do you, do you find? between them and Connecticut, or are there none? <laughs> well, um, interestingly, Connecticut is an amalgamation of big cities, um, ex-urban areas, and rural. We've got all three. So I tend to meet with peers, um, some from, say, Wyoming, uh, some from Chicago, uh, some from uh, suburban Atlanta, and um, you know, the populations there tend to be uh, very similar to portions of Connecticut. Um, and I, I've been amazed, very few states have 169 towns in them. <laughs> so, uh, it, you know, the, it, there is a trend in the U.S. The democracy is stronger typically east of the Mississippi, largely because the towns there are older and local control of those towns has been around for a couple hundred years more than when you go west of the Mississippi because of the way the country developed. Right, and the tradition of the town meeting, which has always been a very New England idea. Yeah, I guess. and yeah. still is around. Yes, it's still there and it, it is quite strong. Yeah. Um, we have a question ab about um, the different programs or the different services you, you mentioned for Connecticut Public. We're all familiar, of course, with PBS and NPR, but you also mentioned uh, Spirit, Kids, and, and Media Vision. Could you give us some more detail on, on those, what they <coughs> are, what they do, what, you know, and so on? Sure. Um, when, uh, when the pandemic hit, we had three uh, over-the-air channels, meaning all you needed were uh, rabbit ears to get the signal. CPTV, right. which is probably our most prominent brand, Spirit, and um, something called Create. Create was a syndicated uh, grouping of shows that focused on cooking, uh, decorating, travel, that kind of stuff. When the pandemic hit, we had some research from PBS that showed 
we because we didn't have PBS Kids over the air, we just had it on digital. We were missing about five hundred thousand uh, people in Connecticut um, who were not able to get us because they didn't have internet or they didn't have access to uh, a, a digital pathway. So we made the decision uh, four or five months after the pandemic started to uh, dedicate one of our three channels uh, to PBS Kids 24 seven. And we did that again, not for commercial reasons, but for reasons to address if a family didn't have access to the internet, they could still get high quality kids programming um, uh, for free. Um, Spirit has become kind of an amalgamation of uh, uh, travel content, some content from Create, uh, as well as some well-known uh, public media features like you can see uh, Bob the Painter, uh, I forget his last name, but very well-known PBS shows on Spirit. And then on CPTV, we run kids programming in the morning. And then it, and we transition into prime time, starting with uh, Judy Woodruff, et cetera. What I think you'll see us doing over the next two to three years, and we frankly would have loved to have done this earlier, is to take some of our locally produced radio shows, and we do about 11 hours a week, <clears throat> and tape them, and take those tapings and put them on CPTV, which would add to the amount of local programming that we run on CPTV. The pandemic <laughs> screwed up the, uh, the yeah. plan for that. But, you know, as soon as we get past it and we feel it's safe, um, you'll see more and more local television uh, running on our CPTV channel. Well, that's good to know. We'll all have to look for that for sure. Okay. Um, we have a, a few questions related to, to funding. Um, the um, sources of your funding, we're guessing, you know, federal, state, corporate, foundation, individuals, uh, without giving a, a, an exact number, I don't expect you to know percentages or whatever, but uh, where does most of your funding come from? Well, I'll give you, um, I'll give you a quick uh, rundown of the big ones and then answer the federal government uh, question, because everybody always asks, how much money are you getting from the federal government? So we have a $20 million budget a year, about seven or eight of that comes from membership, people who during the fund drives and uh, in response to some digital offerings donate to us directly. Uh, we have about <clears throat> uh, two to three million from grants and foundations. And we've got about two million from larger donors, meaning $1,000 and more. We also get about $3 million from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, but I should put an asterisk on that. <clears throat> that shows up as revenue, but because we're an affiliate, and by the way, this dynamic happens in commercial radio and television too. What happens is we will get roughly $3 million from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And we pay about a million back directly to NPR, and we pay about two million back to PBS for our ability to become an affiliate. So when you when you do the math on it, it it it's three million in the door, and it's three million out the door. <laughs> so that really, it, you know, from my way of looking at a PNL, um, it's a wash. Uh, but those are the big chunks, Margaret, and. Um, uh, we, you know, we, we would love, um, more and more members, particularly in Fairfield County. Uh, so all you have to do is go to ctpublic.org and there's a big donate button right up there. I hate to be shameless, but. Okay. Uh, well, well, so. we'll certainly have a look at that. And okay. has, has that changed over time? Uh, I mean, yes. I know you haven't been there all along. So, so what have been the changes you've seen in fun and what would you expect for the future? You think well, that balance is going to change? Um, clearly, the membership business uh, is going to be driven more and more as a digital business. So roughly half of our donations come in through some digital method. And uh, very recently in the last year, we've been really emphasizing 
getting people to become sustainers. And by that, I mean, you give the donation once and it comes out every month. Um, and we're at 50% sustainers now and would like to get that up to about 80% over time. That allows for a steady revenue base for us. Um, what's been um, really pleasantly surprising is we raised about $2 million a couple of years ago for to stand up an investigative journalism unit called the Accountability Project. We started that in March. Uh, but um, we have found an interest on the part of lots of foundations to help support investigative journalism. And those three people can work on stories that might take a couple weeks to do, but can make a major impact on the state. Um, and the only other thing I'll mention is we're the lead station in something called the New England News Collaborative. So we, uh, along with WGBH and WBUR and Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire and WSHU, um, share stories. And so uh, it's led by a woman named Vanessa De La Torre who works um, in our uh, building. And um, it's a way to kind of take whatever work we do that is germane to New England and make sure that there's a distribution mechanism that works really well. Great, right. well, we're so glad it does work well. Uh, we have a number of questions related to the size of your audience, both you know, the viewers and, and, the, and the listeners. Um, do you do any particular promotions or activities to try to increase the number of, of viewers and listeners that you have for your program? We do. Uh, we have a dedicated marketing department that works on a number of digital targeting strategies for shows when we have them. I think I showed you some of the, the external methods we're using on billboards right. and on train stations and on, in Moffley Media and other print uh, publications. Um, and I don't want to get too boring, but when I mentioned the million, um, I've been at this a terribly long time. And since Al Gore invented the internet in 95, <laughs> legacy media companies have been wrestling with this issue of, okay, now there's this new method of consumption. How do you count it? Nielsen has not figured it out. So what we do is we basically say, let's take the Nielsen numbers, let's take the um, radio numbers, let's take everything that we do and measure it. And, and we add it up and we audit it once a year to make sure that we're not making the stuff up. But unless we're capturing everything that we do, not just over traditional means, but over digital means, we're not telling the true picture. Um, so one of the measurements of success for us is growing that audience. We're, uh, as of November, I think our total audience was up 9%. So we feel pretty good about that. In, in an era where media, traditional media's audiences are being very, very strongly challenged. Yeah, and a related question, somebody wants to know if um, part of that increase is with the younger audience or is it across the board that you're, you're getting? We, um, we look at our uh, traditional audiences, television and radio, radio in particular, with demographics so we can tell, and yes, we are reaching more ethnically diverse and more and younger people, but we're also measuring the people that we have on our airwaves. So for every guest who comes on, for every source that we use, we track their ethnicity and their location so that we'll, we'll be able to tell, are we including a more representative group uh, throughout the state of Connecticut than we would have been by just going to the same sources over and over and over again. Because that's a challenge, uh, particularly for a producer of a show who's mm -hmm. got to, <laughs> you know, it's easy. Yeah. It's, it's not easy, but it's, it's certainly um, more predictable if you can go to the same people and they all, you know, largely are uh, white um, as opposed to making the effort to go and get more diverse, broader audiences. And our producers are doing that and making really good progress. Oh, great. Well, that's good to know. And just actually, we just have time for a, a final question. So I'll ask one question related to what we were just talking about. 
um, as to whether or not any of those efforts are directed toward people outside Connecticut or do you see your potential population as just within the state? Well, I mean, if you live um, in Greenwich or if you live up in Stonington, you can get three PBS stations, you can get a variety of NPR stations. So what we're really focused on, uh, maybe myopically, uh, but we're really focused on Connecticut. What is it that our efforts can put and put into the the media ether that can be the one place where you can go and know that you're going to get stories about Connecticut? I haven't lived here a long time, but I've lived in a lot of different places in the country. This is a pretty nice state. I know there's a whole stream of uh, <laughs> negative arguments for that, but yeah. what what we wanted to make sure of is that. Um, all of our efforts focused on what's going on within the boundaries of our state, to some extent, New England, but largely the state of Connecticut. Okay, well, we're happy you do such a good job of it. So um, then, as I said, I'm, we are out of time, so I'm sorry I'm going to have to end this, but we all look forward to future contact, if not with you, then certainly with Connecticut public. So. Uh, right. We're going to sign off from now. I'm going to say goodbye to all the wise women and, um, you know, hope everyone has a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Bye.